Uh, as you know, the structure of the court is that we have lecture, which I talk, and then we have discussion. Discussion, you could ask questions, I can ask you questions. Like, oh, I'm really anxious to ask Grant something. Uh, for just to clarify, you know, to clarify these things, right? So, uh, by the way, if there are anyone left upstairs, and if they are interested in participating in the discussion, oh, please, please come downstairs. Okay, questions? Yes. So one of the trouble I have with civilizations is believing it. Because some of the events are really hard to believe. For example, Mahabharata, right? I heard that Arjuna went to heaven to buy, get divine weapons to defeat Gaurava. Yes. I haven't seen anybody going to heaven alive in this century and coming back to heaven. Ah. You, again, you confuse a beautiful story with reality. There are many things which are much more beautiful than real things. Let me, let me show, I mean, Mahabharata gives you a remarkable amount of wonderful stories, and many of them are instructive. Let me give you an instructive story, which sort of, I think, is one of the most edifying stories in, in the world and in Mahabharata. At the end of Mahabharata, you know, it's sad, basically everybody's dead. And Pandavas, the good guys, have to walk to heaven. And the, in India, if you want to go to heaven, where do you go? Himalayas, of course. Uh, you could just climb up to heaven. So they go to Himalayas. They go. And one after another, they die. One dies, another dies, the third dies. The wife, you don't know about Draupadi, but she dies. Everybody dies. And who is left? Yudhishthira the oldest brother, the oldest of Pandavas. And he is the man who is the most just man in the world. And every Indian knows that he lied only one time. And they know. Am I correct? Every Indian knows. And they know what happened to his chariot after that. Oh, see, they all know. This is, you down, that's all right. But uh, so they, this is not part of my story. So you just did a go. And while they walk, they walk from about where Delhi is to, you know, Himalayas. Hello, Greg, join us, join us. So you were the only one upstairs? Ah. Uh, you guys should have joined. So he, he walks, he walks to, to this high mountain to get to heaven. There is this dog. You have to go to India to see the dog. Dogs in India are not dogs in Palo Alto. <laughs> they're not dogs which are pampered, well fed. They're just dogs. And people throw stuff at them. They kick them. Am I right? They're not. There's this dog who just comes along. And so they walk, they walk, they walk. With the dog, you just reaches the place they enter, sign heaven, and there is Indra standing there. Indra is sort of the top god of the previous generation. Indian gods, very confusing. I could explain one day, but it's very confusing. Indra standing, it says, oh, welcome, you just did it. You're welcome to go to heaven. No dogs allowed, he says. Oh, obviously, you couldn't manage a dog, heaven. I mean, you know, it wouldn't work. And here, you just did it, says something, which my heart stops when he says it. I don't know whether it happened whether it's a story or what, but it's so beautiful. What does he say? He says, if my companion, if my faithful companion doesn't go, I do not go. I'll go to hell. I will perish. But I will not go without the dog. And this is some let down. And you say it's not realistic. Apparently, the dog is not a dog. It's Yudhishthira's father who is the god Dharma, uh, who turns and everything's happen. But at that point, whether it's, it's true or it is not, this is something so profound there that you should learn. Don't you think you should learn from this story? Well, I think you should. 
I think everywhere, even a nil. <laughs> Not a nil, okay. But should, should learn. It's a wonderful story, the story of compassion. And it's not about, you say, oh, it's, I never go to heaven with dogs. I know. But, you know, there are so many other situations where, you know, you don't want to accept something if you cannot share it with your faithful companion, whether it's a deal, riot, or whoever. Right? We have to, I think, you know, this story is one of those stories which forms civilizations. Why I love India is because they have a story like that. You know, when I go there and I see reality, reality, oh, India, you've seen Indian reality. There are many ugly things there. But the stories, the stories are beautiful. And it's not just with Indian civilization, okay? I love Greeks. I'm what is known Hellenophile. But I love long dead Greeks, right? sort of real Greeks in Greece. I, I must love them as I must love everyone, but it's hard. <laughs> it's not, I mean, nothing, I mean, I could replace Greeks with any other group. It's hard, right? but Greeks have the stories where I say, these are heirs somehow, whatever Nick knows, he comes from the stock of people who made these songs, who made these myths, who made this place, who made these signs, and they made a lot. Right? And I give him credit. I shouldn't, because he was not. But right? we're all heirs to these stories. These stories make us better. Right? And just, you know, I pick Western. Thing because we, we are in the United States. I have. But I could have done, I actually gave lectures in India where I was concentrating on Gita as the, the path. Because yeah, it's not, I'm not a Hindu, but I wish people in, you know, at least Hindus in India, would read Gita. They don't, but you know, they should. So they're. You know, people, people have to, to take this story seriously. Otherwise, what do you take seriously? Your bank account? That's real, but it's boring. And it's not going to make you a better person. Otherwise, Larry Ellison would be a good man. <laughs> yes? So back to the dogs and, uh, and India. Yes. What does it say about the civilization if it's um, uh, uh, shaped by a story like this, a story about uh, you know dogs that should go to heaven or somebody should not go to heaven without them, and like you said, the state of the dogs in India, in like real India, where uh, it doesn't seem like the the this the stories you know applied quite directly. Yes, you see we are. It's a very profound thing, and we're going to see it throughout the course that, you know, you could have three lectures from now. We'll be talking about uh, Thucydides, a great Greek historian. He is an Athenian patriot. He loves Athens. And in the beginning of his book, he talks about great speech by Pericles about the Athens being the school of Greece. And it is, it was. It was the most glorious achievement. And then he writes the whole book showing the total destruction of Greece by greedy, stupid, and evil Athenians. What does it tell us? It tells us that we're human. Right? And the lesson of civilization is precisely to realize that it is in us that, quoting from a relatively late source here, but by the grace of God go I. That is, we can do all of that. What was the most civilized country ever? Anybody know? The most civilized. Germany. Yes, good. He knows. 
is from Israel. <laughs> right? This is the country where, you know, there's great music, great philosophy, great university, everything. It was just oh so wonderful. And it was wonderful, it was not a fake, guys. We have to remember that. Yes? That was truly a great civilization, as great as something around our time was. And then they created the most terrible thing ever. They decided to burn people in gas chambers, just like that, for some their people. You know, from my point of view, a German Jew was a German. From German point of view, of 20 years before, so I mean, these were people with, you know, military decorations who fought for Germany, and they did that. Civilization is very fragile. People could turn and say, "Not us," or "Yes, even us," and that's something we have to remember. That. Yes, we can. We can go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, civilization and culture relationship hierarchical. What is more? Okay. Oh, the the question is: What's the difference between civilization and culture? Civilization is a broader thing. Civilization is a bunch of stories, attitudes, and patterns which allows society to function. Right? Culture, we tend to take only one aspect. Right? For example, civilization does include mating rights. Culture, I mean, how do people, and they say, oh, it's all the same. No, it doesn't go to India. You'll see, it's just different. They are different. I'm not saying better, worse, different. Right? Go to China, it is different. So, civilization is a very broad, again, I will not be able to, to address all of that. But civilization is this entire pattern which defines our behavior. Culture nowadays means certain upper echelons of these patterns. Right? I mean, it does not tell you how marriage happens. It doesn't tell you how people eat. Civilized people don't do that. That's not civilized. They have a very civilized way, but it's different. You probably, I don't know whether you know that, Indians, very civilized Indians, don't use utensils. Or a spoon at best. They eat with their hands. But it's not like that. They eat in a very civilized way. A southern Indian who is eating from a palm leaf, you know, I was thinking about it in all culture or Greek or whatever. There is a term in there. The these or both terms are relatively new. The most terms are relatively new. Culture is usually meant by something professor at Stanford will teach you. I doubt it. I haven't seen much culture there. But civilization, as I said, Param's grandmother. Civilization is much more at the gut level. Right? Universities are wonderful and we have to respect them, no matter what I say. Right? But they are secondary to the fundamental culture. Greeks were civilized long before Plato invented the first university. So is it safe to say that inside one timeline of one civilization could be multiple cultures? It's very complicated. There are clearly multiple cultures within the same civilization. There are multi as multiple religions. Right? If you look at gypsies in Europe, they're not the mainline culture, right? but they're part of European civilization. So if you cannot have a story of Europe without story of gypsies. You cannot understand Liszt music, great Hungarian composer, without gypsy influence. I'm going to say even something which might annoy some of my Jewish friends. Jews in Europe were not a separate civilization. They were part of European civilization with a somewhat different culture. Well, for sure, a different religion. Right? And again, it's, it's, it's a tension. It's very, again, 
you know, from my point of view, again, it was a terrible, tragic event that Europe lost the Jews. They went to Israel right? and decided to start their own civilization. It's a tragic event for Europe. Maybe for them not. Uh, maybe for them too. That, that's, that's to be, to be, I mean, but yes, they were part of European civilization. Yes, I mean, Heinrich Heine was a great German poet. He was Jewish. Right? Um, Hitler didn't like the fact, but nothing could be done. Right? And it's just, it's integral, it's integral part. And in, in some sense, in many, as we shall see in the West, uh, Jews play central role. You cannot, ex Christianity cannot explain itself without Jews. But the same thing is true in India. There are all these subgroups, different, which are also necessary for India to fully explain themselves. You know, without Parsis, you know, you wouldn't have capitalism in India because this small group sort of was able to create this seeds. You know about Tatas, right? But you know, there, there was some small group, very closed. But it is Indian. You couldn't say that you know, they're not Indian. And they were central to, of creating Indian civilization. So it's complicated. Life is very complicated. Right? Oh, you didn't know. <laughs> so, and we have to so, sort of, again, the tricky thing for us, of course, is to, in a very short people say, oh, this is much as they say, oh, you will find enough material for 30 lectures. That's exactly what. Well, guys, that's not the problem. The problem is what not to say. Because material are for million lectures. So again, I hope it will all conclude with, you know, that I'll cover it will be a coherent course. Hopefully not everybody will drop. We do need some of you to come, please, please. Okay? Uh, yes? So you asked the question, what's the greatest civilization? I'm not the question I asked. Never. Well, somebody said German. Now, uh, what's the greatest recent? That was not. The most civilized country. It's not what I asked. What was the most civilized country? OK, and why did you agree to that? So to how Germany? Did, how did you define more civilized? By you know, by carefully, I mean, you have to, well, you know, just go to Germany even now. I mean, you know, there is a red light and no traffic, and everybody stands and waits. You know, <laughs> yes, the, the yes, it's discipline at every level. Yes, it's a great regard for culture, or at least traditionally, before the collapse. So sort of if you take the Germany of the Kaiser, you know, this is the Germany of great universities, of enormous regard for culture, well, of working class playing Schubert. Okay. You know, it's, it was good. It was good, integrated with, you know, Jews and Christians and Catholics living, Protestants living happily together, right? And being proud of this. German culture, Kultur, that was very great. I mean, yes. Sadly enough, they also thought that they could spread it. You know, there is a terrible mistake. If you have something good, nevertheless, be modest. <laughs> Don't try to spread it. Yes? Yes? But, but isn't that the burden of civilization? Uh, there is a point of view like that. You know, white man's destiny, burden of civilization. But that is a very dangerous view. You see, in some sense, I could be very, I am very proud of Western culture. I am, however, very reluctant to spread it to India. Right? Sort of, moreover, in, in my particular case, uh, sort of to, to open up, I'm a Catholic, I go to church. But I think that missionaries should be very careful. Not because I have any doubts in the truth of Christianity, 
But I think they should be extremely careful. If I want to show the truth of Christianity, I should stop beating my wife. That's the first step. Uh, I don't actually beat my wife. But, uh, <laughs> but you see my point. Right? If we are so proud of our civilization, let us turn our society on shiny beacon on the hill. Right? So, who are, I mean, it's this important thing. Who am I to tell Indians? They have these great things. They have to go their path. And yes, if they could learn from me, this is good. But I have to be very careful. Right? They have a great tradition. And within their tradition, OK, there was a famous Russian philosopher, which no Russian nowadays knows, uh, Vladimir Solovyov. I'm correct, no Russian knows. So uh, you know, Soviet education did a fantastic job. So. Uh, once upon a time, he was writing sort of a relatively satirical piece exactly on this thing. That there is this World Congress of Religion. Everybody comes and you know trying to convert, and he says, "Well, you know, the, uh, all these Buddhists and uh, um, uh, Hinduists come and they say, oh, you Christians, you have this wonderful religion, and you don't follow it. So, you know, let us, we maybe have a bad religion, but we follow it. Huh? So, I, every time I go to India, I'm very impressed by the fact how many people are actually still practice their religion. Right? They might be a wrong <laughs> religion, but they practice it. Right? They come a little bit earlier. I am still impressed how many Indians stick to their dietary, very strict sometimes, dietary laws. Right? And wouldn't break them, into, even under very, very harsh sort of thing. I mean, I'm not, I don't have time to tell you about what us Westerners call Indian mutiny and how it started, but it had something to do with uh, British government sort of using all kind of fat on cartridges, and you had to bite it off. So uh, what do you use, beef or pork? If you have both, Muslim. Uh, uh, yeah. So I mean, we have to have high regard. We have to admire that, for example, we have to admire Hindus who survived sultans of Delhi, who survived uh, you know, Mughals, who survived the British Raj. Right? And right now, surviving Western you know, Steve Jobs. <laughs> yes. I, I think you make a good point there, especially about uh, the, the British Raj and, and this concept of empire and the proliferation of, of civilization to, to a mass of people who uh, uh, perhaps are unwilling to accept the, 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 the subjective truth of that civilization as being <coughs> superior to another civilization. We will be talking about it later, yes. But you have to remember, I mean, they didn't spread anything. Sort of the amazing thing is enormous failure of the Raj as civilizational instrument. Okay. Uh, if you have time as a civilizational uh, reading, there's a beautiful essay by George Orwell on shooting the elephant. That talks about civilizations. Uh, he learned. So it's, you read it, so you, you know. It's a very short one. Yes? So can we talk about civilization without talking about religion? No. Why? It's a, it's a factual thing. It's like saying, could we talk about civilization without mentioning uh, literature? No. No. I mean, this, the, I cannot describe India without talking about Indian religion. Right? A person cannot understand Western civilization without, you don't have to, you say, do I have to be a Christian? Well, first of all, you are not. So could you be a Western civilized person? Absolutely. Could you be a Western civilized person without 
knowing the Bible well? No. Richard Dawkins says so. Okay, I am not sure he's civilized, but that's another story. It's again, we have to distinguish between believing things and knowing things. Right? You, you cannot, sort of the idea is that I, I'll just, you know, and I will read Harry Potter. Well, yeah, but, you know, you, you, you could see that. I don't believe that Harry Potter is a civilization-forming book. Uh, <laughs> maybe. But, by the way, sort of the, you cannot understand Western civilization without reading some very racy books. Uh, this year, there is a 200-year uh, anniversary uh, of the birth of Anthony Trollope. No? Okay. One of the greatest English novelists of all times. This is why it's celebrated. So, uh, one of his best, maybe at least for sure his most popular book, is Barchester Towers, or oh, so hilarious. And one of the heroes of these Barchester Towers is certain Archdeacon Grantly, a certain Church of England ecclesiastic, Archdeacon Grantly. And when he goes to prepare his sermon in his cabinet, he unlocks his desk and gets a volume of Rabelais. So if you didn't understand what I said, you're not civilized. That is, you have to understand that one of the central books in European civilization is François Rabelais, Gargantua et Pantagruel, a book uh, which uh, dedicated to, uh, I will have, I mean, I have difficulty. I'll have to cover it, but if anybody, f you know, anything I say about the book is going to be against HR policies. <laughs> it contains nothing decent whatsoever. Could you understand Europe without it? No, because part of the European tradition is this carnival tradition, right? Where you talk about and do things we are not supposed to do. It goes back to a religion, Roman religion, Saturnalia, right? It goes back to Athenian theater great theater, which would start always with four plays in a competition. We will talk about, you have to understand Greek drama, it's such a wonderful thing. So it starts with four plays, three plays, which would be oh so very serious about things like, you know, gods and men, you know, fate and uh, profound stuff. And the fourth one, there will be guy with elongated things attached to their things, and they were doing this. It's very phallic. It, will be, it was called satiric play. Right? So you cannot, if you read Aristophanes, it's very hard to translate. Again, I, I, will, I have difficulty figuring out how I could talk to you, because like, uh, most of you are too young. <laughs> you know, it's, right? But it's central. So it's not, we are confusing the same sort of, the Puritanism is a branch of Western <laughs> civilization. It isn't the main branch. There are very few Puritans in Italy. No, it's just, no Italians here? Well, whatever. If there were, it's, not, it's not a Puritanic country. Right? Even you say, oh, it means that they're bad Christians? No, they, many of them are. Most Christians are bad Christians, by the way. It's, it's just like most people, most Hindus are bad Hindus, most Muslims are bad. I mean, we're just, we, yeah, this is a fate of us. Most communists are bad communists. I mean, what, whatever. We, we're not good at what we do. Most programmers. <laughs> you know, it's, we cannot, we are flawed. Haven't you observed? This is something I learned. You know, no, it's an experimental fact. So,
it's that, and it's complicated. It's again, you have to realize that it's, it's a struggle. It's an individual struggle. It's a struggle of the society. It's the struggle of civilization. Well, struggle. It's a, it's a long, difficult, painful process through which we all, and again, what I'm, you know, I'm right now sort of at the, at the end of my at least public career, maybe private career too. So you know, I want to say to youngsters like Ryan, look, you have to make an effort. Again, what could you do again? Could Ryan save Western civilization? Okay, the answer is no. <laughs> but he should try. That's the paradoxical thing. It's like, if you are a soldier, you cannot win a war. Does it need saving? Yes, every civilization needs saving because the worst thing is not civilization, right? This is, this is such. In fact, I think that's a, a, a wonderful point, and I hope that you talk about that. I will talk about it. The battle, okay, let me conclude our discussion. Do you remember the clash of civilization? The battle. The battle is going on, but it's going on here. It's not us versus them. It's not with drones. It's daily struggle. You know, the, all civilizations have a notion of fight. I'm going to say a word which would be hated by many, jihad. Jihad means struggle. Right? And the struggle is inside of ours. It's not, it's not Anil I have to struggle with. It's myself. Well, sometimes with Anil, too. You know, we used to work together, so I do. But, uh, you know, it's, it's internal. The civilization conflict, it's a conflict between civilization and anti-chaos when we talk about some, what is known as creation myth, when we get to that. We shall see that, the sort of order versus chaos. It's, it's one of fundamental things. And Ryan has to fight on the side of the angels. Another side of Ryan will fight, of course, with the other side. It's tough, all of, all of us. So this, so, and by the way, it's not that I'm sitting here because I am more civilized. I'm sitting here because Brian asked me to sit here. I mean, this is, you know, in many respects, uh, just short aside about when I came to the United States, uh, I remember I, one of my first jobs. I worked for General Electric Research, large company. I had a li very large research lab, and I was astonished how civilized it was. How, you know, the, everybody around me was civilized. There was one not civilized person there. It was me. That sort of I learned so. I learned from people around me. But then, sadly enough, you know, I moved to here, and here the balance is different. The old truths of American civilization are no longer self-evident. Right? I remember that short time after I moved, I worked for a company where the president of the company, during the all hands, was about 3,000 people present, mooned the entire company. If you, know, if you don't know what mooning is, look it up. So that was not a very civilized, so I moved from a very civilized environment, environment where people were playing Chopin on a Steinway, to, which actually was true, general research. There was a wonderful Steinway. People would just pass by, sit down, and just play something. You know. Very well. I mean, and they were not hired guys, right? So, to Mooning, last Saturday, I attended a major event at Computer History Museum, which was celebrating several distinguished computer scientists becoming fellows. My friend Paul was with me there. After the reception, they invited us to a place with Go, go, girls. Let me tell you, that did look civilized. Did it look civilized? No. It was 
actually some younger people who are not accustomed, like people like Paul and me, well, we see that all. But younger people were actually complaining. They thought it was disgraceful. Um, Nicholas. You mean they complaining on the quality of both girls? <laughs> no, they were complaining on the presence of go, go, girls. Sort of that, that you see changes. For example, apparently the young people, there was this young person, their friend, son of, of our friend, who, young person, very hands tall, has a PhD from Harvard, who thought that it was very offensive. Unlike old gizzards who invited go, go girls, whomever they were. We probably know them. Uh, but, you know, so it's a struggle. Right? And it's not, it's not, I'm not saying that I'm civilized. I'm not saying, you know, some people say, oh, and I could be misunderstood sometimes. You say, United States is uncivilized. Of course it is uncivilized. Every part of the world is uncivilized. We have to fight. Everybody has to fight. It's not, and it's not good guys against bad guys. It's you against you. It's the one, I mean, like there is a part of Ryan which wants to play video game. There is another part which wants to listen to Bach. I am correct, right? For both. They both exist. That's, you know, that's the struggle. You know. And he's capable of both. I see him, you know, attending Baroque operas, as we did on Monday, uh, together. And I seen him spending months playing utterly idiotic video games. So, uh, same Ryan. So, is he good, bad? No, he is right. He is a human being. Sorry, but you know, <laughs> next time I'll use a new. <laughs> but it's not, I mean, we're all, you know, we all have this tension, but it's not, I'm not sitting, this is not a judgment seat, guys. This is, by the way, it's, in any case, even if it is, it's very uncomfortable. <laughs> so, at least in this, I mean, it's not cushioned or anything. Uh, all right, I think we are, uh, we had enough of discussion. So we could, I mean, you know, I'm not trying to put a time limit or anything. I mean, there is a time limit on the lecture, 45 minutes, guys, and no interruptions. This, and then you want to talk, we could talk all you want. Okay, thank you.